Welcome to our update on the FASB's new ASU 2017-05 on the derecognition of non-financial assets. The ASU also covers partial sales and defines in-substance non-financial assets. We will also refer to the new standard as ASC 61020 since that is a subtopic that was updated by this ASU. The project is the second phase of the FASB's project on clarifying the definition of a business which includes three phases. The FASB issued ASU 2017-01, clarifying the definition of a business, in January 2017, which was Phase 1. Phase 3 is evaluating the accounting differences between a business combination and an asset acquisition, which is in the research stage. Today, we'll provide you an overview of ASU 2017-05 and work through an example that we hope will help your understanding of the new standard. My name is Sam Hall. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Bob Mosier. We are both senior managers in KPMG's Department of Professional Practice. So with that, Bob, can you take us through what is in scope of ASC 61020? Sure, Sam. The new standard clarified the scope of subtopic 61020 so that entities will apply its guidance to both transfers of non-financial assets as well as each distinct asset in a group of assets or subsidiary in which substantially all the fair value is concentrated in non-financial assets. Non-financial assets include intangible assets, land, buildings, and materials and supplies. The ASU defines an in-substance non-financial asset as financial assets, such as a receivable, included in a contract or consolidated subsidiary in which substantially all of the fair value is concentrated in non-financial assets. Cash is ignored and would not be included for this determination. Substantially all is generally interpreted as 90% in U.S. GAAP. The ASU also applies to derecognition of assets within a non-business subsidiary when substantially all the subsidiary's fair value is concentrated in non-financial assets. This also applies when the seller retains a non-controlling interest in the transferred non-financial asset or subsidiary that is not a business. For example, partial sales. Now that we know what is in scope, Sam, can you tell us what is not in scope? Of course. This is where it gets a bit complicated. If an entity transfers assets to a customer, it accounts for the transaction under ASC 606. If the transferred asset is an investment, such as equity method investment, an entity accounts for the transaction under the guidance on transfers of financial assets under ASC 860. If the group or subsidiary is a business and is sold to a non-customer, an entity accounts for the transaction under the derecognition guidance in ASC 810. If substantially all of the fair value of a transferred subsidiary that is not a business is not concentrated in non-financial assets, an entity accounts for the transaction under the derecognition guidance in ASC 810. If a non-financial asset is transferred as consideration in a business combination, an entity accounts for the transfer under ASC 805. As you can see, the scoping ended up being a bit complicated to simply say this is for the derecognition of non-financial assets or in-substance non-financial assets. I do not think the scope will be difficult to apply in most cases. There are a number of other items that are not in scope, which we discuss in more detail in Defining Issues 17-6 available on our KPMG Financial Reporting View website. Sam, that is helpful. Seems to me the definition of a business is pretty important to this standard. Maybe it would help if we walk through how and when to derecognize a non-financial asset. When an entity transfers non-financial assets included in a subsidiary and retains or receives an equity interest, it first determines whether it has retained a controlling interest in the subsidiary's assets. If so, the entity does not derecognize the assets and accounts for the sale of the non-controlling interest under the consolidation guidance covering decreases in ownership. That guidance results in recognizing the gain or loss in equity. If the entity did not retain a controlling interest, it evaluates whether a contract exists and whether it has transferred control of the underlying assets to their owner, i.e. the subsidiary, using the new revenue recognition guidance in Topic 606. An entity also would use the guidance in the new revenue recognition standard to identify each distinct non-financial and in-substance non-financial asset within the subsidiary. 
The individual assets are the unit of account for derecognition. So the entity measures its gain or loss on the derecognition of each distinct non-financial asset as the difference between the amount of consideration received and the carrying amount of the distinct non-financial or in substance non-financial asset. The consideration received includes the transaction price as determined using the new revenue recognition guidance and the carrying amount of liabilities assumed by the other party. If there is more than one distinct non-financial asset, the entity allocates the total consideration received under the contract to each distinct non-financial asset using the allocation guidance in the new revenue recognition standard. Sam, can you walk us through an example of a partial sale? Sure. Let's assume that Entity A owns 100% of Entity X that holds a commercial building. In this example, substantially all of the fair value of Entity X is concentrated in non-financial assets, so all of Entity X's assets are subject to subtopic 61020. Entity A sells 50% of their interest in Entity X to Entity B for $5 million in cash, and it retains a 50% interest in Entity X. In this example, assume that Entity X doesn't meet the definition of a business, and Entity A has determined that it no longer has a controlling financial interest in Entity X, based on the guidance in ASCA 10. Because Entity A no longer has a controlling financial interest, for example, it would deconsolidate Entity X post-sale, we move on to the principles of ASC 606 to see if, number one, a contract exists, and number two, Entity X has control of the building. Entity A determines that both of these conditions have been met, so now it will need to determine how to measure the gain or loss on the sale. If we assume that the carrying amount of Entity X is $7 million to Entity A, and the fair value of Entity X is $10 million, then Entity A would recognize a gain of $3 million. In this example, the cash of $5 million they received for selling a 50% interest, plus the fair value of the retained interest of $5 million, represents the total consideration of $10 million. The total consideration of $10 million, less the carrying amount of $7 million, gives Entity A a gain of $3 million. With that, Bob, can you walk us through the effective date and transition of the standard? An entity is required to apply the amendments in this ASU at the same time that it applies the new revenue recognition standard. However, the earliest an entity may apply the ASU or the new revenue recognition standard is for annual and interim periods in fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2016. An entity can elect to use a full retrospective or modified retrospective approach regardless of which approach it chooses for adopting the new revenue recognition standard. At adoption, an entity must apply the new definition of a business to determine which transactions are in the scope of the new ASU, regardless of the entity's transition method. However, an entity does not need to revisit its existing allocation to goodwill if it changes its conclusion about whether a transferred group of assets is a business. Thanks, Bob. That's all the time we have. We hope the information we provided gives you some insight into ASU 2017-05 on the recognition of gains and losses from the derecognition of non-financial assets. Thanks for joining us.